Matthew 7, 21 through 23. The sermon title this morning is called The Seven Scariest Words. And no, those words aren't, there's no more food on the buffet. That was from Pastor Craig, by the way, so I can't claim credit for that one. But the seven scariest words, Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you again for your word, for uh, loving us. And I pray, Lord, for each and every one in this place, may we never hear those scary words, depart from me, for I never knew you. But rather, may we hear, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. And I just ask for your continued guidance and direction. I thank you for the willingness of the people here to serve you, to love you, and to put you first. And if there's any in this place who don't know Jesus as Savior, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. Today would be the day that they choose to put Jesus as the Lord of their life, to repent of their sin and walk after you. May they avoid the consequence of sin, which is eternal separation from you and hell. And may they choose to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We love you and praise you, Father. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Go ahead and smile at somebody as you have a seat this morning. If you're here this morning and you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, or if you have walked away from him and, and are, um, have, have been thinking about coming back, I want to let you know that I'm not going to pull any punches this morning, that the reason we are doing this service is just for you. If you haven't made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, or if you've walked away from him, I would like you, for to, you to listen intently to this message entitled, The Seven Scariest Words. C.S. Lewis said, A world of nice people, content in their own niceness, looking no further, turned away from God, would be just as uh, desperately in need of salvation as a miserable world, and might even be more difficult to save. I know this for a fact. I know this is true. I can remember there was a job I worked down in Charleston, and uh, the, the, the man I worked for was probably one of the nicest people I've ever worked for. And we'll just call him Mr. Jim. Mr. Jim was a nice man. He uh, was a great guy to work for, easy to work along with. As a matter of fact, he had a quite a good sense of humor. It was kind of dry, which I really, I, I like a dry sense of humor. The phone would ring there at the office, and I would hear him say, get that phone, it's Big Ed. Now, for those of you that don't know who Big Ed is, that would have been Ed McMahon, and what the, he is associated with is the publisher's clearinghouse. So every time the phone would ring, he'd say, get that phone, it's Big Ed. Now, I know Ed McMahon's dead now. Somebody else is doing that whole thing. But, but it was just funny to hear him talk. But I got to speak to him about the gospel one time, and I remember him telling me, he said, Jason, I'm a good person. I really don't need Jesus. And that was heartbreaking to hear because I liked Mr. Jim. I liked him a lot. I really enjoyed being in his presence. But he was lost. And even though he was a nice person, and by the world standards, he was a good person. But we're going to find out today whether or not we are actually good people. Continuing on, I want to ask you something. If you try and rescue someone who's drowning and doesn't think that they are, see how they react. If you, try, you, know, you know that they're drowning and they don't think they are. See how they react. They get mad at you. You may think that you're a good person and don't need saved. And I want to challenge you this morning to open your ears and your eyes and see that the water of sin and death is around your neck and the waves are crashing in, just as someone who is drowning. When Jesus hung out with the sinners, the religious people criticized him. I'm not coming down here for long, Mike. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I'm just coming to get my sword. My other sword. And the religious people criticized Jesus for hanging out with sinners. And he answered them in three different parables. The lost sheep in Luke 15, 1 through 7. And he continued on with the lost coin in Luke 15, 8 through 10. And then the lost son in Luke 15, 11 through 30, 32. 
You know, the shepherd left the 99 in search of the one. We have a, a continuing project here at First Assembly called After the, or Project 99, where we're after the one. We've specifically targeted a .99 radius around our church to go after that one, where we've given out books and testimonies of, 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 of stories of people who needed Christ, who have come from the darkest of times. It's called Through the Dark. You know, with the, the 99 sheep, the shepherd didn't say, ah, well, you know, 99% isn't bad. You're going to lose one every once in a while. No. When the, when the peasant woman swept the reed-covered dirt floor until she found the, the lost coin, she didn't say, oh, well, you know, it's, it's only a day's worth of wages. No, she swept the floor. She looked for it. The father, when he, in the prodigal son, the parable of the prodigal son, he checks the road for the sign of the lost son's return. Daily, he's out there straining his eyes, looking for that lost son. And he didn't say, well, forget him. He's going to be such an idiot. I'll just pour all my life into my older son. No, in each case, the value of what's lost dictated an intensive search. And Jesus is saying that the value of lost people demands an intensive search search. It demands an intensive response. It demands us to look hard for that lost thing. Our failures to reach our community stem more from, from faulty perspective than from faulty technique. Intensive searches happen only when we place a premium on the lost item. Technique usually takes care of itself when we share Jesus's perspective on people. May we have a heart for the lost and a heart for the Lord's will. When we bump into people during the day, how do we view them? We can judge them by their attitude, but the truth, truth is that they're lost. And if they're lost, then they are valuable in the eyes of the Lord, and they should be valuable in our eyes. When we value lost people as Jesus did, outreach will happen, and more people will sing, I once was lost, but now I'm found. T'was blind, but now I see. And today we're talking about the seven scariest words. They're spoken by Jesus and found in our passage that we read this morning. And those seven words, I never knew you, depart from me. There's no more scarier words than a person can hear than to hear those words spoken by Christ. Our points to ponder this morning are threefold. When will those words be spoken? Number two, who will hear them? And number three, how to avoid hearing the seven scariest words. So let's dive right into the first question. When will they be spoken? When will those words be spoken? Matthew 7, 22 says, Many will say to me in that day. I want you to notice a few things about this, a number of things to consider. Many will say to him, not just a few. That's a scary thought in and of itself. These are people that are actually meeting Jesus face to face. They're seeing him. They're speaking directly to him. Not in prayer, but actually right there physically in his presence. This is a physical encounter with the creator of the universe. And in that day, this is a reference to the day of judgment. And yes, there is a day of judgment coming upon this earth. Hebrews 9.27 says, And it is appointed for men to die once. But after this, the judgment. You see, you can live once and die twice. Or you can die twice and live once. And what do I mean by that? To live once and die twice means I'm just going to live my life as I please. I'm going to live for myself only. Then there's death, the physical sense. And then there's the spiritual death. The, continue, the second death is what we call it. And that's when the body and soul are thrown into the lake of fire forever and ever and ever. Never to escape. And then there's die twice and live once. And what that means is you die the physical, uh, you, you, you die the, uh, you lift, lift, let's see, what did I just say? I got them all mixed up here, sorry. But we, we surrender ourselves to Christ. We, 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 we die to, to, to ourselves and we surrender ourselves to Christ. We live here in, in our bodies. Our spirits become born again. We die once and live twice. And then we, we live again forever and ever and ever with Christ. But in that, we, we are dead to sin. We no longer live for sin, but we live for Christ. Judgment happens once we leave this body. That is when in that day happens for mankind. And the seven scariest words will be spoken on the day of judgment. 
And these are words that no one wants to hear. Why would no one want to hear them? Well, separation from Jesus Christ entails more than just being separated from Him. You see, one of the soft ways that Christians get around telling the truth of judgment is that they say, well, if you don't accept Christ, you'll be separated from God. Listen, to a non-believer, that's good news because they don't like God to start with. But what they don't realize is what separation from God means, the full entirety of it. Because God is the giver of life, guess what you're separated from? Life. That means you are living in continual death in hell. Since God is the one who gave us air to breathe, guess what you're separated from? Air. Can you imagine living for eternity like this? Bill Weiss talks about that in his vision of hell. Since God is the giver of water, guess what you're separated from? Water. You say, how? Prove that in scriptures. The story of Lazarus and the rich man, and we'll get to that in just a few minutes. Lazarus was, uh, Lazarus was taken to, to Abraham's bosom, and at that point, he, you could see hell and you, you, Abraham's bosom, which was a paradise at the time. And the rich man who didn't live his life for the Lord, if you will, and he was suffering torments, plural, in hell. And he was in such torment that he asked Abraham to let Lazarus just dip his fingers in water so that at least one drop could come upon his tongue. He couldn't do it, obviously, because there was a, a gulf fixed between them that they couldn't pass from one side to the other. But he was in such torment that just one drop of water would have been satisfying. Since, the God, since God is the giver of health, guess what else is people in hell are separated from? Health. God is the giver of light. He is the father of light. Guess what else is separated from them? Light. It's a place of outer darkness and eternal torments. So when we say, but you'll be separated from God, there is a whole lot more that they are separated from. God is the giver of a sound mind. Guess what else they're separated from? A sound mind. It's a place of confusion and torment. You say, why are you talking about this? Jesus didn't talk about hell. <laughs> Truth be told, Jesus spent more time on hell than he did on heaven. You're like, what? Yeah, it's a true story, bro. I'll read it again. <laughs> Jesus spent more time on hell than he did on heaven. Some of the things Jesus said about hell, we're going to go through those. Matthew 10, 28. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather, what? Fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. There's also the parable of the wedding feast. You can find this in Matthew chapter 22. The, 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 the giver of the feast invited all of his friends and they wouldn't come. And so he invited, he said, he told the servants, they weren't worthy to come. You go out there, invite the lame, the maimed, the people by the highways and byways out in the fields, invite them all in, bring them all in. So he did. He filled up the house with strangers and was, they were getting ready to have the feast. In Matthew twenty two eleven 11 through 14 states, but when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Oh, by the way, that's another aspect of hell. For many are called, but few are chosen. For years, I didn't understand this parable because I couldn't figure out why God had, or why the, the master of the ceremonies there had invited people in, and then he kicks one out after he invites him in. Friend, why aren't you wearing a wedding garment? And that was the key. I'm not Jewish, so I didn't understand this from a Jewish perspective until I was taught the Jewish perspective. You see, at that time, when they were invited in for the feast, they were also given wedding garments to put on. And when you are invited into the kingdom of God, you're given a garment that you have to put on in order to stay there. And it's called a garment of salvation. It is a wedding garment. It's for the bride. Hello, are you just with me? And if you don't have on the garment of salvation, you cannot expect to stay and eat at the feast. But instead, those without the garment of salvation will be cast into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Do you have your garment on this morning? And I'm, not, I'm talking to you, you out there that may not have on the garment or you've chosen to take it off for one reason or another. Today is the day to put that garment back on. Amen? 
The chosen ones are the ones that choose to put on the wedding garment, that is the garment of salvation. And we see in this passage that hell, not only is it a place that lacks water, not only is it a place of torment, but it's also a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 13, verses 41 and 42 states, The Son of Man will send out His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Again, it's a place of everlasting fire and torment. You say, why is it a fire? Because God's wrath is poured out in the form of fire. We hear the term, God's wrath is kindled against them that don't believe. The only thing you can really kindle is a fire. And we're not talking about the thing you read off of. But you kindle a fire. And God's wrath comes out as a form of fire. And it's poured out on on the unrighteous forever, forever and ever. It's also a place of darkness, Matthew 8, 12. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, does this sound like a place that people are going to party at? No. Does it sound like a place where people are going to hang out together at? No. It's a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's a place of torments, plural. Hell is a place of torment. Luke 16, 23. And being in torments... Notice that's plural in Hades. He lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Torments, plural. It's not just separation from God, which in alone itself would be terrible, but it's also separation from every good thing that he has given. It's eternal punishment, Matthew 25, 46. And these will go away into everlasting punishment. You may ask, if God's so loving, why would he send people to a place of torment? Why should we think that God has less sense of judgment than mankind? God is loving, but that's not all. He is also a good judge. Would a loving human judge allow a criminal to go free? No, he wouldn't. If we would prosecute criminals, how much more will God do so to them that break his law? You see, God alone is holy. He is, he is the standard of all that is right and good. His nature is pure. If you see up on the screen, we've got a picture of a leaf and a match. <clears throat> Their natures are opposed to each other. If you notice, that leaf is dry. What's going to happen when that lit match hits that leaf? Is the match going to turn into a leaf? Nope. <laughs> that leaf is going to burn up, is it not? Their natures are opposed to one another. God and man have opposing natures as well. It isn't that God is unloving. It is that he is holy. God is described as an all-consuming fire in Hebrews 12, 29. He dwells in unapproachable light. And in our sinful state, we don't stand a chance, just like that leaf doesn't stand a chance against a lit match. You may say, but I'm a good person. And that leads us to point number two. Who will hear those seven scariest words? Depart from me, I never knew you. Those that have broken the law of God. Even people that the world would consider good. And I use that term loosely. So what is the law of God? Well, if you would, open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20. I'm going to grab one of these rent swords down here. I would like everybody to open up their Bibles this morning. Exodus chapter 20. And if you have one of these rent swords that I call them either from the, the back of the pew, that's on page 65. In Exodus chapter 20, we find what are called the Ten Commandments. Now, if you notice, they're called commandments, not suggestions. Amen? Starting in verse 3. What does verse 3 say? Let's read it together. You shall have no other gods before me. You say, well, I I haven't done that. Really? Has God always been number one in your life? And you need to answer this question for yourself. Has God always been number one in your life? Number, uh, verse number four, you should not make for yourselves any craved or carved image, or any craved one for that matter, or any likeness of anything that's in the heaven above or that's earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. In other words, don't bow down to any graven images. You say, well, I haven't bowed down to anything. Well, listen, idolatry takes place in the heart. 
when we start putting other things ahead of God, ahead of time with Him, when we start putting things in our heart that are before God, that's when we're guilty of idolatry. Commandment number three, do not take the Lord thy God's name in vain. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in, in, in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Commandment number four, which is in verse eight, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Have you kept the Sabbath day holy all time, every time? Commandment number five, and I would like for all of us to read the very first line there uh, on page 65 together. It's honor your father and your mother. If you notice, this is the first commandment with a promise as well. It says that your days may be long upon the land which your Lord your God is going to give you. Sorry, guys. Have you always honored your father and your mother? Commandment number six, verse 13. Let's read it together. You shall not murder. Have you, you say, well, I, I'm good. I'm clean here. <laughs> I haven't murdered anybody. Here's how high God's standards are. God said, if, even if you hate somebody in your heart, you've committed, a, uh, you've committed murder against them. Let's move on to commandment number, uh, the next commandment. You shall not commit adultery. You say, well, I haven't committed adultery. Well, Jesus said God's, God's standards are so high that even if we look with lust, we're committing adultery in our heart. Number, uh, number nine, you shall not, what? Steal. Have you ever taken anything that didn't belong to you? Well, if you did, then you're a, a stealer, <laughs> a thief. <laughs> Commandment number six, uh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the verse numbers. Commandment number uh, nine, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, right? That means do not lie. And then commandment number 10, you shall not covet, right? And all those different things are listed there. So we've just looked at the 10 commandments. Have you ever coveted anything? We can just look at four of these things. And most of us say, yeah, I'm a lying, thieving, blasphemous, adulterer at heart. That's where we get into problems. And back to our scripture that we looked at, you can close your Bibles now. Well, if you want to follow along, you can. But, but back to what we looked at earlier, who, do, who hears these words? The people who have broken the law of God, even people who would consider the world would consider good. And what's interesting is that the Ten Commandments, the law of God, is written on all of our hearts. If you go into the court of law and you lie under oath, you're in trouble, are you not? Okay? If, if you notice, it's illegal to murder someone, is it not? Okay? These things, our, our law is based off of moral law and where we got that from is because God has written it upon our hearts. So have you broken any of the t Ten Commandments? If you're truthful, you've broken of at least one. And knowing that you've broken the law of God, let's revisit our passage this morning, Matthew seven twenty three, And then I will declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me, you who, what? Practice lawlessness. Are you practicing lawlessness? The answer to point number two, who will hear the seven scariest words? Every person that practiced lawlessness, lawlessness. That is those who have broken the Ten Commandments. Even if you've only broken one, you're guilty of breaking them all. By now, I hope that your palms are sweating, your heart's racing, and you're sitting on the edge of your seat as you come to realize that eternity in hell is just one heartbeat away from you. But this leads us to our concluding point. How to avoid hearing the seven scariest words. I never knew you. Depart from me. The first thing is to recognize and admit that you are a sinner. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every person has sinned against the Lord by breaking his law. You see, the good news makes no sense to a person who hasn't been told why it's good news. Repent of sin is the second step. That means to turn from those things, to no longer walk in those things. And number three is to confess Jesus as Lord. Romans 10, 9 through 11 says, And if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, Whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. 
You put Jesus on like you would a parachute. There's an example that we like to give, and it talks about a, two passengers riding an airplane. The first one is told to put on a parachute because it'll make his flight better. So he puts on the parachute reluctantly, and as he has it upon his shoulders, he realizes real quickly that it is bulky, it's heavy, and it is not comfortable at all. As a matter of fact, it keeps him pushed forward in his seat so that he can't recline very well. And as he's riding in this airplane, he notices that the passengers around him begin to laugh at him, point at him, and mock him. And pretty soon, he becomes disillusioned. He jumps up and takes off the parachute, throws it to the ground, and says, is that too stupid parachute? It'll be a, a long day before I ever put one of those back on my back again. He hadn't been told why he needed the parachute. Now, the story of our second passenger. He is told to put on the parachute because there is a jump to come. 35,000 feet, jump out of an airplane, no parachute, <laughs> game over. And that parachute will make sure that he gets to the ground safely. And he puts the parachute on, not for a comfortable ride, but rather because he knows that in a short while, he doesn't know exactly when, he's going to have to jump out of that airplane. Have you put the parachute on this morning for a comfy ride through life, or have you put it on to escape the jump to come? To make things worse, it's a new stewardess day, and she's walking down the aisleway with hot coffee, and she managed to stumble when the, the plane hit some turbulence and splash his hot coffee upon the passenger number two. Now, does he look down, wince, jump up, and say, that stupid parachute? No. As a matter of fact, he even clings tightly, tighter to it and looks forward to the jump to come. Because he knew he didn't put it on for a comfortable ride. He put it on to escape the jump to come. And when we put on Christ, we're actually putting him on to escape the wrath to come. God's wrath is, is kindling against mankind because of sin, because of the fall of man. All of us, in one way or another, have broken God's law. Only those that have repented of, of breaking his law and have put on the garment of salvation, which is the parachute, the, Jesus Christ, are the ones that will be able to escape the jump to come, which is the wrath to come. And as Bruce comes this morning, I want to ask you a few questions. Have you put on Jesus Christ to, jump, to escape the jump to come? Have you put him on to escape the wrath to come? What have you done with Jesus? Have you walked into the feast and thought, I don't need Jesus? My friend, it's, there is a time coming when the King of kings and Lord of lords is going to look at those people and say, why are you in here without the garments on? Don't be that person. Don't be that person that hears those seven scariest words, depart from me, I never knew you. But rather, be the person when the Lord sees you come in, says, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. This life on earth is very short and compared to eternity. And as you stand with me, I want you to reflect and think. I want you to honestly evaluate yourself. Have you put your faith and trust in Christ alone? Have you made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life? And if you haven't, today is the day of salvation. And as Bruce leads us in a song, I'd like for somebody to go ahead and get Caitlin. We've got a baptismal service today as well. And listen, that's another beauty of being a, a born-again believer. It is, we have a time where, where we can come before him and show the world an outward sign that we have died with Christ and come up again with him. As Bruce leads us in a song, would you come and join me at the altar for those that need Christ as Savior? Or if you want to come back to the Lord, and we'll even open it up. If you've got some things you'd like to deal with the Lord this morning, would you join me this morning as we sing?
can we go to the Lord together in prayer before we go into the baptismal service? Father, we thank you and praise you. We thank you for Jesus, for giving us a way to escape the wrath to come. We thank you that you loved us so much that Christ, you died for us while we were yet sinners. And Lord, I thank you that you didn't stay dead, but you rose again on the third day so that we can have eternal life with you. And for any that's in this place, Lord, I lift them to you right now that don't know Jesus as Savior. That they wouldn't wait another day, but today would be the day of salvation. Again, thank you for Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to get ready for baptism. Bruce is going to lead us in another song. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is my. Christ. And at this time, I'm going to have, ask Caitlin to join me down here in the baptismal pool. Caitlin came the other night and asked if it was too late to be baptized. And uh, I said, no, <laughs> it's never too late to be baptized. So um, she's excited to be here. And I asked her if she wanted to say anything. And she said, <laughs> but Caitlin has put her faith and trust in Christ and she is asked to be baptized to follow the Lord into water baptism and before we do I would encourage anybody out there if you have not followed the Lord in water baptism to go ahead and do so it's a wonderful experience so Caitlin if you would take a stand over here and turn around and face this way there you go and I'm going to have you to make your handle okay and you'll plug your nose there you go and Caitlin I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
Amen. What a privilege it is to be baptized and follow the Lord in water baptism. And we're proud of you, Caitlin. And Bruce, if you would, close us in a word of prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. Let us pray. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this day that you've given us. And we just thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to, to die and take our sins, Lord, and take our punishment. And Father, we just thank you for Caitlin being baptized today and her faith in you. Father, we just pray that you'd go with us today and that you would keep us all safe, Lord, and bring us back next week. In Jesus' name.